Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. In this video, I want to give you a guide on how you can create the most successful tank for your brachiopods. I just want to make it clear that I am a hobbyist and everything in this video is based on my own experience and research. I don't know everything and there's still plenty of information for me to learn. So with that being said, also please do your own research. To begin this video, I wanted to do an introduction to the class Brachiopoda, which literally means gill-footed, as it is referring to the distinctive leaf-like appendages that function both as limbs for swimming and as gills for respiration. There are three major orders that belong to the class Brachiopoda. That includes Nodostraca, Conchostraca, and Onostraca. Or as most people know, your tadpole shrimps, clam shrimps, and fairy shrimps. Now, these are primitive crustaceans that remained relatively unchanged for millions of years. They're often considered living fossils with body plans that echo ancient aquatic life. What these brachiopods are most known for are inhabiting habitats known as ephemeral ponds or vernal pools, and being able to survive these habitats with such harsh conditions, which leads me into the life cycle of brachiopods, and we'll begin with the egg stage. These eggs are remarkably resilient, as they can survive drying, freezing, and years of dormancy until conditions are just right. The hatching of these eggs are triggered when water returns into their habitats, usually after rainfall. And like I said, these habitats can be vernal pools, wetlands, or ephemeral ponds. The conditions for these eggs to hatch varies on different environmental cues, such as hydration, temperature shifts, and sometimes even light exposure. But most importantly, what they all need is exposure to water. Once they hatch, a larva emerges from the egg known as a null ply. And this is the earliest stage of these crustaceans. They are tiny, translucent, and equipped with simple appendages for swimming. As they continue to grow, they'll go through multiple molts by shedding their exoskeleton, allowing for an increased size and also the development of new structures. And at this stage, they're also feeding on microscopic algae, bacteria, and detritus. Because their habitats can be unstable, they have very fast or rapid growth rates. Depending on the species, adults typically reach maturity within days to a week. And this is all dependent on the temperature and food availability. Once they're fully mature with their specialized appendages, they are ready for reproduction. And some adults can actually produce hundreds of eggs before the pools dry. And like I said, their habitat can be unstable, so it can last anywhere from two to three weeks, and usually the lifespan of the organisms are tied to the duration of the pool. So once the pool dries out and the organisms perish, they will actually leave behind the desiccant resistant eggs that will remain dormant in the soil until the next cycle. Now, when creating your brachiopod tank and setting everything up, your goal is essentially is to mimic their natural environment. But this can be highly dependent on the type of brachiopod that you're growing and the specific species. But I can give you the general guideline and later in the video I can talk about all the different factors that play in. The first item that you're going to need is a container. I usually work with containers that hold two to three gallons of water, but this is up to your own discretion. I just wouldn't recommend anything below one gallon, especially if you don't have any air circulation. Also keep in mind, depending on the species that you're working with and the amount of individuals that are in the container. Obviously, if you have larger and more individuals, you're going to need much more space. As far as material of the container, either glass or plastic, doesn't really matter as long as it doesn't leach any chemicals into the water. The shape of the container does matter and it helps certain species. So if you're growing tadpole shrimp or clam shrimp, they are more benthic organisms and a lot of surface area is beneficial for them. Once you found your choice of container, the next step is lighting. You have two options, natural or artificial lighting. However, both of them are going to promote algae growth. This is going to be beneficial for all the brachiopods, but especially fairy shrimp that are filter feeders. So you can use a nice sunny window, or if you're like me, you can use LED lights. 
I recommend a photo period of 12 to 14 hours of light per a day, but this can also be up to your own discretion on how you want to manage your algae growth. The next step is water. I've seen so much debate on what water to use. Personally, I use top water and it works fine. Despite what water you decide to use, there are some important things you should know for each of them. If you're using tap water, just know that it probably contains chlorine. So you would need to let it sit out and let the chlorine dissipate for at least 24 hours. Moreover, depending on where you live, you can either have hard or soft water. One thing to keep in mind, if you have old pipes that are made of metals such as copper, this can leach into the water and cause all kinds of issues. The next option is distilled water, which is great for hatching due to the osmotic pressure from the water being so pure. However, for growing, you will quickly notice that it is not so great. Distilled water lacks ions, which are essential for the growth and development of branchiopods. So unless you're using an organic substrate, we will leach minerals into the water. Other substrates are inert. And the branchiopods are going to have trouble regulating bodily functions in an environment that doesn't have the minerals for them. The last option for water that you can use is just natural rainwater. Keep in mind, you'll probably have the same issues if you're using substrate that is inert. Also, because this water is coming from the sky, it is mixed in with carbon dioxide, creating carbonic acid. So it has a slightly acidic pH. Lastly, your best option for water is probably just going to be spring or bottled water that contains sufficient enough minerals for your branchiopods. Most of your branchiopods actually prefer a neutral to slightly alkaline pH. The next component to add to your tank is the substrate. I recommend using sand as it is inert and it's not going to alter the chemistry of your water. I personally add a small pinch of compost or some other source of organic material. And I'll explain why later on in the video. If you decide to use organic substrate, just know it could come with a lot of issues. Depending on the soil, if it is really rich, it can release a lot of tannins into the water. Moreover, it can also release a lot of ammonia. So it can make the water much more acidic and also produce a lot of toxins. I've also heard people doing bare bottom tanks, meaning that there's no substrate. While you can be successful with this, you do need the right tools, especially the right microbial community. The next topic I want to go into is the temperature requirement for branchiopods. And this is highly dependent on the species. A good starting point is room temperature that actually works for a lot of species. However, just know that they're categorized to three groups. You have cold water species, cool water species, and warm water species. So some that occur in the winter, some in the spring, and then some in the summer. But for most of you that are growing fairy shrimp, or especially buying them online, these are going to be warm water species. So that room temperature mark is going to be just fine. Lastly is aeration. I recommend using an air pump to have some sort of aeration in the tank, and this is going to help in general with the hatching of the eggs, the algae growth, and also being able to support a larger population of branchiopods. We have our container, the water, the substrate, the lighting, and our aeration. So at this stage of the setup is where you technically add your eggs and then see them hatch in the next few days. This is where a lot of people go wrong, which is using that distilled water because there isn't any ions to support the organism and their bodily function. Moreover, if they add food, there is no microbial activity to help break down the waste. That waste then produces an ammonia spike, killing off your shrimps. So either way, they were going to perish from the ammonia spike from the food or the water that doesn't contain any ions. Now, if you're already in the aquarium hobby, you already know of the nitrogen cycle. And in this case, it is no different. The branchiopods also need a nitrogen cycle. If you don't know what this process is, I'll do a quick overview. Essentially, the nitrogen cycle is a biological process that makes an aquarium safe for aquatic life. 
So waste produced from the shrimp, uneaten food, and just decaying matter releases ammonia, which is highly toxic to aquatic organisms. Luckily, there are beneficial bacteria that convert ammonia into nitrite, which is technically also harmful, but then they can convert it into nitrate, which is a far less toxic substance and can be managed through water changes or uptake through plants and algae. So once the nitrogen cycle has been established, it supports a healthy balance in the ecosystem by managing the ammonia and nitrate levels. So how do you establish this cycle? And there's actually many different methods online. One common one that I've seen is fishless cycling. You can add a source of ammonia, which could be decomposing organic matter, like a pinch of fish food. And then just test the water regularly until you see the conversion of ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. While this sounds really good, you have the issue of algae blooming and string algae growing in the tank, which can be quite detrimental for your branchiopods. Especially if you're adding the eggs at this stage, the baby branchiopods can actually become entrapped in the string algae and perish. You can also start the tank with the branchiopod eggs and slowly feeding them, hoping that the nitrogen cycle kicks in. Of course, you risk losing them, but that is one other option. Now, what I recommend and what's worked best for me after countless times of doing these tanks is, yes, you have this fishless cycling where you get the nitrogen cycle established. However, don't add any shrimp eggs. Allow the algae and microorganisms to flourish and then drain the tank and let that substrate dry. You will then use this microbe enriched substrate for your new tank and you can add the eggs to the brachiopods immediately. And you will notice a huge difference in the growth and development of your brachiopods since there's actually a microbial community that's going to help with feeding the baby shrimps and also managing the waste that is coming from the byproducts of the food and the shrimp. Now, they say that cycling can take anywhere from two to six weeks to establish that nitrogen cycle. And with my method, you'll notice that it is pretty instantaneous. Within the first few days, you'll see a big boom in the algae development and just everything in the tank community just flourishing. So now that you have a good system going, you can actually add food for the branchiopods. Just make sure not to overfeed because you can still create an ammonia spike. Essentially, all you want to do is add just enough that you're feeding the microorganisms in the tank. Of course, the branchiopods will also eat some of that food, but they're also feeding on the microbes that are existing. Depending on the type of branchiopod you are growing, there are several options for food. But for all the early stages of them, a good option is yeast. And remember, a little goes a long way, but at these early stages, you're also feeding the microbes. So you don't want to feed too much, just enough that the microbes are flourishing, which are feeding the branchiopods, until they're much more developed for larger particles of food. So your fair shrimp and clam shrimp are typically going to be filter feeders, eating algae, bacteria, and just little organisms in the water column. However, tadpole shrimp are more aggressive feeders. They'll actually scavenge for other organisms to eat. So in captivity, you could feed them bloodworms or just fish food. You can even feed them vegetables. But as the tribes get older, I do recommend a bubble filter or some kind of filtration system since it seems like they actually produce a lot of waste. And I have more issues with tadpole shrimp producing an ammonia spike rather than the other two groups. One thing to keep in mind is that these foods are not all equal. So if you're using yeast, this is a living organism and it can actually pull oxygen from the water as they begin to grow, which is not so great for some species of branchiopods that need higher oxygen levels. Moreover, I have read that yeast can produce a lot of ammonia when they begin to perish. And that is also not good, especially if you don't have a community of microbes that can handle that much of ammonia at once. 
So I'll actually try to promote algae growth within my tanks as a food source for the branchiopods. And I've noticed a drastic difference in the growth and development. It is most likely because this food also has several other functions, such as converting the ammonia and nitrates out from the water. Moreover, they can also produce oxygen. So if you're working with species that are very sensitive to ammonia spikes, algae as a food source or using green water might be a better option. Now, the last subject I want to talk about when it comes to culturing branchiopods is the substrate. Now, I told you that I recommend using an inert substrate such as sand, but when it comes to culturing each species of branchiopods, the substrate does have an influence on the water chemistry. So some soils are low in minerals while others are heavily concentrated. But these soils are going to contain a range of major cat and ions that are going to influence the water chemistry. For example, some of the desert soils are more calcareous, meaning that they contain more calcium. So some of these species are going to require a higher calcium concentration. Moreover, naturally you would find calcium in the form of calcium carbonate, or also known as a limestone. So when the soils have limestone, they increase the hardness by adding calcium and magnesium ions. Additionally, the rock is going to release carbonate ions, which are going to increase the alkalinity and pH. So different species are going to require different water chemistry. Most species are going to prefer calcium as the major cation. However, there are a few out there that prefer sodium as the major cation. Not only does the substrate influence where species are distributed, but also the microorganisms that are in symbiosis with them. So certain types of algae will prefer a more calcium-rich environment, while others prefer a more sodium-rich environment. So if you're growing a species, like I said, that is sensitive to these ammonia spikes, you probably have to look into culturing the exact species of either algae or mic microorganisms that they would consume. Now, like I said, I recommend using sand, and I use sand. All you need to do to alter the water chemistry is add the minerals. So you can buy calcium carbonate, calcium sulfate, or sodium chloride if you have a sodium-loving species. So depending on the species, I'll try to guess what the percentage of certain minerals are in the soil. And it works out for the most part. Uh, fairy shrimps tend to have a tolerance to a range of salinities and then ionic compositions. With that being said, most of these warm water fairy shrimps are very tolerant of different conditions. And I would say you're okay with just using the bottled water to culture them. And one more thing before I forget, I actually add a pinch of azomite powder, which is a rock dust with a bunch of trace elements. And this is just to ensure that the branchiopods and other microorganisms are getting all the nutrients that they need. So far, I've had really great results with it, but that is up to your own discretion if you want to use it. I tried to cover the most information that I can. I know I'm missing pieces here and there. There's just so much that goes into it, but please leave a comment below if I miss something or you have a question. Other than that, this basically concludes the video, but I wish you success and I hope this method works for you. If you want to see more content about branchiopods, please subscribe to my channel, share my content. Your support means a lot and I really appreciate it. Other than that, I will see you in the next video.